Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission show. If you have a scary, true work story and want us to narrate it, send it to us at darkstories.org. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? This week at Dead and Roasted has been rough. There have been tons of customers, but we're short an employee. You see, I had to fire old Greg. He kept strangling customers. I told him, Greg, you only get two, and he went for a third. That jerk. Uh, hey, welcome back. I was just about to go on break. Lucky you, because I've got some new, scary, and allegedly true work stories to share. There will be violent exes, suspicious homeowners, and ghosts in the office. Enjoy. These are Tales from the Break Room. My New Job From Matt I previously worked in finance, but due to the fact I loathed my job, and due to my talents being entirely unrelated to finance, I decided to branch out for other jobs. The bank I worked at opened up an executive security position. I was friends with some guys on the security team, and I was always secretly envious of their jobs. Being able to walk around all day, chat with the pretty girls at their desks, a stress-free job most of the time. I decided to apply. After all, I had experience working a similar position at a different bank. I got an interview. In the meeting, they informed me that weapons qualification was mandatory, and physical fitness was also mandatory. This came as a surprise to me as half their team already was pretty out of shape. They asked if I had law enforcement or military experience. I said I didn't, but I grew up a wrestler and could hold my own. I also grew up shooting and would have no issues handling a weapon. And most importantly, working in finance gave me a silver tongue. I could talk my way out of problems and negotiate like no one's business. They seemed good with my responses. Before they would give me the job, they wanted me to shadow one of the team members to see if I was well received with the staff. It was great walking around and checking doors and things like that, instead of sitting at my desk, contemplating jumping out the window. I was fortunate enough to be offered the job, but at a pay decrease. This wasn't ideal, but I was happy to oblige for the sake of my sanity. They did promise a lot of promotional opportunities and qualification testing, which would pay more down the road. I accepted the job. First thing, they got me fitted for a suit. They wore snazzy suits every day, to look professional, and also because suits make it easy to conceal a firearm. I got two tailor-fitted suits and another $400 to use towards more clothes, to wear on duty, or a duty weapon if I needed one. I already had a gun much nicer than what their $400 would buy me so I spent it on ammunition and additional clothes to wear with my suit. They trained me to monitor the cameras and motion alarms in their high security room, which we called the office. I could monitor activity in every room in the 14-story building, excluding the bathrooms and locker rooms, of course. I also had access to all the banking branches in seven different states. In case of robbery, or worse, we could have eyes on the situation to report to the police. I was also trained to operate a garage door remotely, to let vendors and deliverers make deliveries to a warehouse in the basement. It was pretty chill. Not only did we work in the corporate offices located in various cities, but we were also to provide executive security for the CEO when he traveled. He didn't need it, he just liked feeling important. We were also required to work traveling security at various branches in rougher parts of towns, that had frequent violent guests or robberies, as it was cheaper for them to place actual bank employees as security than it was to have a local police officer be there. It was an awesome job, stress-free compared to my last job. I was able to prioritize physical fitness and training and spend downtime schmoozing with all the guests and being friendly. We were required to have one person work a week of evening shifts every month and a half. That's where the excitement of my story really begins. 
My first evening shift was actually a special assignment. Usually, they only have night shifts at the main corporate office, but due to some weird scheduling conflicts, they wanted me to spend the evening at one of these smaller offices in a rough part of town. They leased the second floor out to the city, which hosted Alcoholics Anonymous meetings weekly, which is why I was there. It was nothing against the guests. It was that they couldn't let potential guests have unmonitored access downstairs where all the sensitive banking information was, or say, where the vault was located. I didn't mind at all and had a good time greeting everyone there for their meeting and seeing everyone leave when it was finished. Eventually, the group host, a young woman, told me she was too scared to walk to her car alone at night and was hoping I could walk with her to her car to make sure nothing spooky happened. I was happy to oblige. She was kind, and we made small talk. She told me her name was Alexandra, but she went by Alex. She parked behind the building, away from where her group members parked. It was relatively unlit. She fumbled for her keys in her bag and ended up dropping them on the ground. She bent over to pick them up and I noticed bruises on her arm. I asked if she was okay, and she seemed anxious that I asked at all. Quickly, she pulled her sleeves back down to hide them. She gave me some excuse about bruising easily and just being clumsy. She then opened her car door and drove away. I went back inside. For some reason, they wanted me to stay and guard the building even though the group had left. I didn't mind. I got paid extra for night shifts, and I liked being up at night anyway. I did some rounds, made sure there were no stragglers squatting in the building, and I made sure all the doors and windows were locked. I found a little office perpendicular to the main lobby, and I sat in a chair to watch something on my phone. Probably a UFC fight, maybe even that 70s show or something. After a moment, I heard loud banging at the front door, which I had just come in from. I looked out the window of the office I was in, and I noticed my car was still the only car in the parking lot. My first thought was maybe this was some hobo tweaking out. I looked out the office door, and I saw a large man who was pretty well-dressed, but he looked angry and disheveled. He kept pulling his hair periodically while yelling. He was yelling my name. There was no reason anyone around here should be angry with me, let alone know my name. I spoke to him through the doorbell intercom system we had. I could barely understand what he was saying. But eventually, I made it out. Alex, she cheated on me with you. Followed by various expletives. I tried explaining calmly that I'd just met this Alex that day, and I barely even knew her name. He was confused. He was truly a psycho. I remembered the bruises on Alex's arms and realized why she'd been so scared to walk to her car alone. He pushed his way into the lobby through the broken glass. He had steel toe working boots on and a thick construction worker type of jacket or coat. He was much bigger than me, probably a strong six foot three. He was holding a large rock and he muttered in rage, you know what happened to the last guy she cheated on me with. He threw the rock right at my face. I only narrowly dodged it. I closed the distance quickly and grabbed him in a clinch. The goal was to move his legs so I could trip him and potentially gain an advantageous position on the ground to restrain him. But he was as strong as an ox, likely an experienced wrestler as well. He effectively countered my double underhooks and threw a punch that made me hear bells ring. I knew I had no choice anymore. I drew my pistol and demanded he get on the ground. Right then, to my relief, a spotlight shined on him from the front door, and I noticed red and blue lights in the parking lot. The police quickly were able to subdue him and get him in cuffs, although he resisted them as well. The police took my statement and also took the security footage from the camera system. I told them he must be nuts and abusive. He was trying to kill me over a woman I had just met. They told me I was lucky they were already close by when they got the call. I called my manager and went home. 
They gave me a couple of days off to relax. I was okay, mostly glad it ended with everyone alive and that the cops prioritized my call. I was asked to go back to that building for night security again a couple weeks later. I was happy to see that the door was fixed. Same sort of meeting, it was a positive shift despite my trauma. I saw Alex again, and she thanked me for walking her to her car that night. She told me she heard what happened, and that he was her crazy abusive ex who had been stalking her everywhere she went. She told me she had a restraining order, which he ignored and was now in jail. We later discovered that he was hiding in the parking lot waiting for Alex. He listened to our conversation, and that's how he learned my name. For whatever reason, he decided to target me instead. Alex and I became friends. I started then submitting job applications to do literally anything else. I can't do the same thing for too long. Hopefully I don't have any more crazy work stories to submit after this. Cautious Canvassing From Billy Towers I took a job as a canvasser when I was 23. I worked with a local television network that had employees who went through the town gathering any kind of donations they could. The first week went by just fine, if you can count barely any donations and miles of walking as just fine. Rain, sleet, or shine, they said, and they meant it. I took the job in the summer, but that didn't mean any lack of burning sunshine or drenching rain. I was only there for three weeks. I wasn't much of a smooth talker, and I was an even worse salesman. I just don't have the talent of blatantly lying, even if it was for a good cause, and people often shut the door immediately after they see the clipboard and name tag. I'm not gonna lie, I would have had the same reaction. But the reaction I wasn't expecting was from a house that I'd encountered on my second week working there. The day started like any other day. I got to the building that served as our headquarters, went to the briefing, had my coffee, and went to the van with my team. It was a sunny day as we drove to the location we were canvassing. It was a spread out suburban area with wide roads and thin sidewalks. There were a handful of large houses with spacious gardens that were often fenced in and away from the other gardens. These people valued their privacy and I can respect that. We were given our clipboards, pens, and tablets, then sent down our respective blocks. I began my shift with a gentle stroll. I was going to be walking for at least eight hours today and my supervisor advised me to reserve my energy as much as possible. Plus, it was a nice day out. I figured I might as well enjoy it. I walked up to my first address on the list, a large brick house that sat at the top of a small hill with a walkway of stairs. I climbed those stairs with a half-hearted sprint. If I wanted to make it up this hill, I had to put out a little more energy. I took a second to catch my breath, then knocked on the first door, being sure to be firm but not overbearing as I took my knuckles to the wood. I stood in silence. Nothing. I gave a 10 second reprieve before knocking again. Still, nothing. Guess no one's home, I thought. Or maybe they're not feeling social today. Again, I can respect that. And honestly, I was hoping for a quiet day. This job required a lot of talking. And while I did enjoy casual conversation, the spiel I had to deliver every time someone opened the door left me winded and bewildered. The fewer I had to do, the better. I took out my tablet and scrolled down to the address I was currently at. I marked it as no answer. I clicked confirm on the tablet and began my quick descent down the stairs. I moved on to the next house on my list. It was two houses down below the hill, a small white house with shingles on the dirty windows. This house had a small wooden picket fence that was open. We were told that if the gate was closed, to move on and mark it as no response. 
but in case of an open fence, it was considered a regular yard. So, I walked right in. Behind the fence, the yard seemed overgrown. Vines scattered in several directions, and the grass was tall enough to reach my ankles on the walkway. The grass and vines scratched and tickled my calves, nearly wrapping around my ankles with every step I took. I turned to the left of the garden and saw one of the many sights that would stay with me after I was done with this job. There, growing in a small garden box, were chili peppers that were a deep royal purple. I later realized these were quite common, but at the time they truly mystified me because I'd never seen anything like that before. I turned to the left then, and I saw strange plants with bright green round leaves. My better instincts told me to let them be. I'd thank those instincts later, after I found out what the leaves were. Growing next to them was a small bush with yellow fibers coming from the branches. Something about this plant seemed enchanting, inviting even. I would have loved to investigate further, but it was rude to stay longer than I needed to be there, and I honestly just wanted to move on with my day. I continued my walk toward the house, avoiding the small vines and long grass as best as possible as I began to climb the steps up to their porch. The steps were wooden and rotten. The white paint that clung to it was faded and chipped, almost non-existent, except for the few flecks left. I began to walk up the stairs, the wood creaking from my weight, almost threatening to break beneath me. I reached the final step onto the landing where a screen door greeted me. I looked at the windows on either side of the house to see that they were completely covered in newspapers that seemed to be attached by duct tape. Every inch of glass was sealed with newspaper, making it impossible to see inside. Uh, I guessed some people like their privacy more than others, and how they got that privacy was their own business. I reached for the handle and pressed the lock button and the door opened. We were told that if the screen door was open, we could go in to knock on the house door, so I proceeded to do so. What I saw was by far the strangest living situation I'd ever seen. It took more effort than I normally put in to get the door open. When I finally got inside, I quickly learned why. Blocking the door was a pile of packages from every carrier imaginable. Amazon, USPS, FedEx, meal prep boxes, many more. The small porch had a distinct smell of mildew and rot, as if a carcass had been wading in water and mold had begun to grow on the decaying flesh. Given how high and wide these boxes' towers were, a small animal might have died in here. I had no intention of finding out. Despite my initial reaction, my first thought was to turn around and run. Something else told me to see this through, to see where this course of action would take me. To this day, I'm still not sure if that was the right decision. I navigated my way through the cardboard jungle, stepping over and pushing my way through delivery boxes and rush orders. As I stepped over one box, I lost my footing, and my foot went crashing through a cardboard cube. My foot landed in something warm and wet. I held back the urge to vomit what little food I had that morning, and I continued to press forward, not daring to look at the condition my shoe was in. I got up to the door, the same chipped and faded paint that curled on the steps evident on this wooden panel. I reluctantly stuck my hand out toward the door, a moment of fear paralyzing me, if only for a moment, before I gave the door three solid knocks. I stood back about five feet to give the person on the other side space to open the door and feel comfortable. There was an eerie, awkward silence that filled the gap between my knocking and the time between them answering. That's when I heard the sound of scurrying coming from behind the door, a small rapid padding somewhere between footsteps and crawling before it suddenly stopped. I stood in amazement and bewilderment at the sound, my body unable to move or speak. 
I shook off the feeling and tried to keep my composure. My only thought being the sooner I can talk to this person, no matter how strange, the sooner I could leave. I cleared my throat, less concerned with mucus and more worried about the lump of anxiety clustered fear that lodged itself in my windpipe. Uh, hello? I chirped up, my voice cracking as the words left my lungs. The moment I spoke, the scurrying began again, and it was followed by a small, incoherent muttering. My legs began to give out on me as my heart began to palpitate, and I tried to speak up once more. Excuse me, did you say something? I spoke weakly, the air trying to fight its way into my lungs as they closed in on themselves. A mere three seconds passed after I'd spoken when the voice of a woman shouted from just behind the door. Get out! She screamed with more hatred than I thought one human soul could possess. Her rage-filled scream shook the old rotted wood of the porch and caused the weak newspaper-covered glass to vibrate. If it wasn't obvious before, it was clear now that I had overstayed my visit. I spun around inside the small porch, stomping and pushing the boxes out of my way as quickly as I could, tripping over them, throwing them, trying my best to leave this place. I pressed the latch on the screen door, crashed through it, nearly tripping over the porch steps as I made it outside. I dropped onto the last step with the full weight of my body on my left foot, and it cracked in half under the pressure. I hurried to right myself as my momentum had me hurtling for the cement walkway. I stuck out my right foot to brace myself, and as it made contact with the ground, my knee bent inward slightly, sending pins and needles up my leg. The adrenaline coursed through my body, but I didn't care for it. I kept myself moving, trying to get the farthest distance away from this place. I ripped through the weeds and vines that covered the walkway and stumbled through the wood picket fence. I quickly closed the gate behind me and stumbled backward, hitting my back against a nearby tree. I sat near the tree and caught my breath, letting the pain and fear finally soak in past the shock. Ten minutes later, I got to my feet, stumbled with my sprained knee as I made my way back to the car. I had no intention of going on with the rest of my shift. Two weeks later, I was let go because I had not met the goals needed to stay, which was honestly the best news I could have gotten. Not having that job meant I'd need to look for a new one, but it also meant I would never have to set foot in a place like that again. Oh, and you remember those bright round green leaves I mentioned before, which I thankfully ignored? It was poison oak. The folks there were apparently growing poison oak in their yard. Warning, the following story contains depictions of violence against pets. A wolf among dogs. From Bee's Teeth. These stories take place over the last year, from 2022 to 2023. During this time, I was working with dogs. Now, at first glance, that sounds like a great job, right? Sitting around with dogs all day. It can be a great job some days, but on others, it's downright awful. My first weeks working there were easy. I didn't have a ton of responsibilities, and I got to take it slow. I avoided the workplace drama, because I didn't want to taint such a seemingly perfect place of work with negativity. With this recollection of events, I'll focus on the people who I worked with, and one specific character that was odd and scary to work with. Concerning the pet care industry, one might notice a few very clear things about the people who work there. Firstly, a lot of them are introverts. Working with dogs is nice because you don't have to talk to any rude customers, or any Karens most of the time. However, it also meant I didn't have the most talkative of co-workers. For the most part, it's pretty nice working on my own, not talking to anyone. But like most things, it gets a bit old if you do it too much. For me, I felt a sense of familiarity when around co-workers. But looking back, it was essentially working with a bunch of strangers. Most of these people were nice and friendly, but there was one who everyone collectively hated. 
named Jim. Jim was an oddball. He made me uncomfortable by talking down to me and treating me like I was stupid, like I didn't know what I was doing. Jim was probably in his mid-fifties. He had a long ponytail and was very tall. He also smelled like an old pack of beef jerky for some reason. He saw that I was getting more and more responsibility at the job, and I was only 18, so he would always blame me for mistakes that weren't mine, or for doing things that he apparently didn't like. He wasn't in the same department as me. He wasn't in a management position. However, he would still manage to be on my butt about every little thing. His favorite was getting mad at me for checking my phone. Now, I can see how that could be bad, but he would literally be off the property not working and at the public dog park, just about 10 meters away from the facility. He would throw on a hoodie or something, walk by and watch me until I literally glanced at my phone. Then he'd come over and yell at me and go talk to the general manager. Now is probably a good time to mention that the general manager only hired Jim because they knew each other and were friends. The general manager, who was a female in her 50s, was, I quote, a very personal friend of Jim's. Jim worked before as a librarian, from what I heard, and somehow got into pet care, probably because of the pay increase. This man manipulated our general manager so much that he went from being the supervisor of the dog daycare to the assistant general manager, taking over training of all the new employees for their first three days. After the three days were up, they would be free to work with everyone else, and we'd have to correct many mistakes he had taught them. People started getting fed up with Jim, and I was one of them. He always had something to say about how I was doing something wrong and openly talked about me behind my back with other employees. He would do similar things with them. I was a strong, young, somewhat masculine appearing man. However, most of the other people who worked with me were female and less assertive men. Nothing wrong with that, just kind of need to point it out for reasons you'll understand. He would talk down to the female employees and in some cases even corner them. Many co-workers would talk about how uncomfortable he made them. They brought it up to the general manager, but she didn't do anything for the longest time. However, once things got to the point where many PM staff members were wanting to quit, she began to listen. I remember being called into the manager's office one day, upset and somewhat anxious, thinking I was about to get chewed out for being seen on my phone or something. However, they mentioned other co-workers had been saying Jim was unfairly targeting me. I had a chance to explain my side of the story, and he was told to lighten up on me and apologize. His apology was dog crap. He said something along the lines of, I'm sorry you felt that way. That's not how I meant it. Some manipulative stuff right there. For a while, he backed off. Now, you're probably thinking this isn't really scary. Now we get to the fun part. I was training to do daycare as well as boarding, so I could have more variety. That meant more days I'd work with him since he was originally the manager of the daycare. Jim and I never really talked then, even though this was before his behavior was brought up to the higher-ups. He would explain things to me day after day and then nitpick me when I worked with him. Every other employee in the daycare didn't have an issue with me or the way I did things. They understood you wouldn't be perfect after a few shifts. Oh, did I mention every other employee except Jim and myself was a female and about half his age? That says something about how he got away with what he did. Now, I'm on the spectrum. This made it hard for me to tell whether or not my thoughts of me being mistreated were real or if he was justified. Some of the worst things I saw working with dogs was the way this man treated the dogs when he was upset. He would get visibly mad. I would see him grab dogs by the fur and skin and yank them away. He would literally shove dogs off of him that jumped up on him. And the worst of it? He would use leashes to choke the dogs. I remember seeing him have a leash around one of the crazier dog's necks, just yanking on it in such a way that the dog was being hanged, with his back two paws barely touching the ground. 
Now, he made sure never to hurt a dog too severely, and some part of me still wonders if what he did was wrong or justified. But to me, deep down, it was just awful. It had to be wrong. By the looks of it, everyone else seemed too scared to bring it up. Seeing Jim angry was terrifying even to me, who isn't scared of things often. He was the type of man who I could picture murdering someone for teeing him off. It may not sound the scariest, but working with a sociopath is scary, especially one with that much power in the workplace who didn't think twice about abusing animals. I'm sharing this story as I went back to that facility I left for school today. He was still there, and I got the same feeling of discomfort just looking at him. It seems nothing has changed, even when working with animals that sometimes can be kind of violent or vicious. The scariest part is still how the humans that work with us can act. Random Encounter After Work From Zombie I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I was working late one night at my local sub shop. I was the manager at the time, and I had to close the store for the night. After I closed up the store... I began to head home from work. I had to go about eight miles to get home, and the route I take home is close to pitch black. Well, after I left my work, locked it up and made sure everything was good, I started heading back on my electric bike. I had to pull up to a stop at a stoplight, and that was the first time that I didn't feel right. I've taken this route a hundred times, but when I pulled up to the light that night, I sat there waiting for the light to change even though there was no one else on the street. I looked back while waiting, and I saw something. It sounds crazy, but I saw the shadow of a weird creature walking across the two-lane street. What was weird was that it was taking a whole lane by itself. This thing was as big as an SUV. But just as I was looking at it, the light changed, and I zoomed down the road. I didn't feel safe then, I just wanted to get home. After a while, my Google Maps was telling me to take this very dark route next to the waterway where all the rainwater goes when it does rain. I stopped and looked down then, checking out this route, only to see the same shadow walking in the middle of the waterway towards me. Fear broke through my whole body, telling me that I needed to escape. I chose not to take that way, trusting my gut. I took the somewhat lit street home with my whole body trembling. For the next few miles, I checked every second I could to make sure I wasn't being followed. It wasn't until I got home that I finally felt safe, and even then, I was checking all my windows and doors, making sure they were closed and locked. I stayed up all night thinking I was being watched, when I looked outside, just outside the light, I swear I could see something, like a shadow, looking at me from the top of my neighbor's house, just at the edge of the light. It was definitely there, watching me. It wasn't until morning that my gut stopped hurting, and I felt a bit more safe when I could finally see the sun. I've never seen this thing again, but every time I work night shift at work, I feel as if I'm being watched. I don't know what it was, nor do I want to know what it was. I just want to be safe. After all this, I made sure I always had a knife or a firearm on me, just in case it does come back. At least then, I can somewhat defend myself. This was only two weeks ago as of writing this, and I'm scared it might come back. Working Crew From Sean D. Near where I work, there were sections of road being widened. The traffic, because of this, gets pretty ugly during certain hours of the day, causing me to have to take a completely different road to work if I don't want to end up late. The exception to this rule is when I'm going back home from work, since I'm not done until midnight. But... One night in particular was very different. 
All day I didn't see any of the workers out on the road to work, but I did see four men with safety gear on well past midnight when I was coming home. It was otherworldly, seeing the flashing signs active so late at night. As I neared the workers, the hair on the nape of my neck rose. My instincts told me to keep away. I ignored the unusual feeling and rolled my bike past them. They stopped what they were doing, and each one of them stared at me. I nervously nodded my head and said hello. They continued to stare blankly at me, faces completely devoid of expression. Their eyes seemed dead, never blinking once. I began to pedal, not wanting to turn my back to them, but I didn't have an alternative. I went as fast as I could to get away from them. I could feel their stares all the way back home I spent that night, wondering just what I saw. Had I stumbled across tool thieves, or was it something else entirely? At any rate, I've decided that I will wait for the road work to be finished before I use that road again. Supermarket Spirits From Andy Lee when I was 18, I worked at a large supermarket chain in England. After completing a stressful six months at an inner city store, I requested a transfer to a much smaller store in the village in which I lived and grew up in. I thought this would be a great change for me, since it was five minutes from my house and the smaller store would be a lot less stressful alongside my university studies. I never once thought I'd be forced out by something supernatural. I must give some context about the supermarket building, as it wasn't your traditional 70s block of a store. This branch had been erected in the remains of an old pub, which I had often visited as a child. As a kid, there were areas of the pub that I did not like to go into alone. The toilets, the back of the lounge, the upstairs function room. I never knew why, but they all had a heavy feeling in them. When I was 16, my sister told me that the landlord of the pub, Clive, had killed himself many years ago, which may be why I felt the place was so ominous. By the time it was converted to a supermarket, much of the interior had been ripped out and areas that could not be removed had been blocked off with thin plaster walls. The store was long and thin and turned at an almost right angle due to being shaped for the building's original purpose, which meant you could not see either end of the store from the other. It was bright, and there was nothing out of the ordinary that I was aware of. One such area that had not yet been removed was the area where the toilets had been. This area consisted of a white wall and a small space used for storing stock before it went out onto the shelves. The upstairs function room had been split in half, with part becoming the offices and staff room, and the other half remaining as it had been, abandoned. Out of curiosity, my store manager allowed me to go into the abandoned part on my first day, and it was incredibly eerie. But I was reassured that I had entered through the only entrance, which was always locked. For the first two months, nothing out of the ordinary occurred. I worked mostly mid-afternoon, and there were always staff about. It was when I began working night and opening shifts with a skeleton crew that these strange things began. At first, they were subtle. There was a putrid smell that came and went no matter how much we cleaned. Customers often asked about it, and we were told to be honest, and that we had no idea what the smell was. I thought nothing of this, but things quickly escalated. Whilst working a 5 a.m. shift with one other staff member, we began to hear footsteps above us. This would have been normal had we not just unlocked the door and were certain we were the only people in the store. These footsteps also seemed to walk through the office and the staff room, which would have been impossible due to the walls and locked doors. About an hour later, my manager retired to the office to prepare the tills for opening. 
I remained downstairs, stacking newspapers in the stock area, until I heard knocking on the wall beside me. It was coming from the wall blocking off the toilets, which I had so hated as a child. An area of the store no longer accessible. I would be lying if I pretended I wasn't a little spooked. I immediately speed walked upstairs to the office. Before I could get to the top of those stairs, I heard footsteps rapidly pacing up the stairs behind me. The door in front of me then slammed shut. Frankly, I nearly soiled myself. I ran to the office and burst into tears. And when my manager inquired about why I was upset and the slamming doors, all I could say was, I didn't do it. I must have looked terrified because she didn't question it anymore and agreed to stay with me downstairs until the store opened. I experienced this a number of times while working there, and I confided in another staff member, thinking she would tell me I was just crazy. When she told me she felt a certain corner of the store was heavy, I felt almost relieved that I wasn't alone in my experiences. She went on to tell me that the walk-in fridge door had slammed on her once when she was working alone. Had it not been for the internal release, she would have been trapped inside alone all night. There are plenty more experiences. Shadows at the windows of areas not accessible. Items going missing and reappearing in obvious places. I'm not sure why Clive chose me as the focal point. Perhaps I'm more sensitive than others. Maybe it's my connection in the past to this pub. Maybe the staff merely didn't talk about their experiences. But eventually, I was so afraid to go to work that I resigned. I was diagnosed with stress, although I couldn't tell the doctor that the cause was a troublesome landlord spirit. Sometimes I go back into that store, but I never stay long enough for Clive to try any of his old tricks. All I have to say is, Clive, I hope you're at peace and have found someone else to play your jokes on. Kid at the Office From Raven I work at a retail store as an office personnel. During my first few days working, I kept one of my drawers locked where I placed my confidential files. One day I received a report which I placed locked inside the drawer to be signed by the manager. A few days passed, I had the manager sign those papers. When I went back to my desk, I was surprised that my drawer was locked because I was pretty sure that I unlocked it when I took those papers out and I had decided not to lock it back up because I would only be gone for a few minutes. As a new employee, I was quietly trying to unlock the drawer, too shy to ask someone for help. One coworker noticed that I was struggling to open the drawer. They suggested that I call maintenance for help. I took her advice and called for maintenance. I noticed that the people in the office were looking at me, curious if the drawer really did lock on its own. When the maintenance personnel finally removed the lock, to our surprise, the key was inside it, so there's no way the drawer locked on its own. After all, it was built to lock upwards. I remember one of my coworkers saying that it must be the kid trying to welcome me to the office. I then asked, what kid are you talking about? Trying to hide my chills I was experiencing. I was told that there was a kid playing around the office who likes to prank new employees. The thought lingered in my mind for a few days. I always kept an eye on my things and made sure that I brought the drawer key with me every time I pulled out reports to be signed. Since then, a few stories of encounters were shared by the new employees around the office. Some claimed to hear knocking outside their offices, but when they checked, no one was there. Some would hear the bill counter seemingly counting money, but no one was inside the finance office since it was too early for their shift. Eventually, we all got used to it and learned to continue on with our work since all we were experiencing were simple pranks which lasted for a few seconds. We thought that we wouldn't get surprised by any unexplained encounters from that kid anymore. 
It had been quiet for some years since no new employees were hired, not until the recent pandemic. My coworkers and I figured that instead of going out to eat, we would just take our lunch at work and eat at the office. It would be safer that way since we wouldn't be transacting with a lot of different people. During this time, we had a new security personnel in charge of the security cameras. The security room is a small room which is closed at all times, for confidentiality and security reasons. One day while we were having lunch, the security officer who was on the cameras that day, let's call her Miss I, went out of her room to report to us that Mr. C, the person in finance, left his child inside his office. I told her that was impossible, since Mr. C's child was only a few months old and that the office was restricted, since money constantly goes in and out. I, along with my coworkers, saw the blood drain from Miss I's face. After a few minutes, Mr. C came into the office to join us for lunch. Again, Miss I told Mr. C that he had left his child inside his office, assuming that maybe we were playing a prank on her with what I had said earlier. Mr. C was confused and told her, That's impossible. My kid's just a few months old. I can't possibly bring him to work. Miss I quickly returned to check the cameras, then came out of her office after a few seconds, saying, I swear there was a kid sitting on your chair. Are you sure? I asked. She asked us to come and check the cameras with her, but when we did, no one was sitting at the chair. We didn't speak of it because we could clearly see the fear in her face. He's not there anymore, but I, I swear I saw it. She explained. I told her that there was a kid in the office who liked to play pranks on new employees. I assured her that he was harmless and just enjoyed taunting the employees. She asked if she could go get some fresh air and return after a few minutes. I said... Okay, just be back before the manager notices. After a few minutes while we were eating our lunch and chatting about our day, our heads simultaneously turned to one of the chairs inside the office. We asked one another, Did you hear that? We all had heard the chair squeaking, like someone was sitting in it, playing and turning the chair around. We all stared at the chair, then looked at each other. We nervously laughed and tried to brush it off. We continued with our lunch, then heard it again. We stared at the chair, waiting for it to move, but it didn't. I must admit, I was freaked out at the moment. I have had an encounter with the drawer, heard stories, but I've never experienced anything like this, this close to me, and actually hearing things. We continued to eat while talking about the kid. The chair squeaked louder. One of our co-workers said out loud, May we please eat without you scaring us? Mr. C said, Would you like some food? We can share with you. We waited for an answer, but there was just silence. So then we continued to eat. This time there was no more squeaking. I'm still working there, and I've been hearing stories from new employees about their experiences. I, along with some old employees, simply assure them that the ghost is harmless and that they will eventually learn to continue on with the day with the little boy being a part of the office. Although I still wonder about the origin of the boy since I've yet to hear where he comes from. The Things in the Factory From Zad OMC I'm a night security guard. At one point, I worked at an old abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. This factory was a site that had been abandoned for years, but it was still full of valuable machinery and equipment that had not yet been removed. There were concerns that the equipment could be stolen or damaged, which would be a significant financial loss to the company that owned it. My job was to monitor the security cameras, conduct regular patrols of the property, and respond to any security breaches or alarms. The job paid well, but it was also a job that came with its fair share of strange occurrences. 
One night as I was making my rounds, I heard a weird noise coming from one of the factory's unused wings. I cautiously made my way over, flashlight in hand, and peered through the doorway. To my horror, I saw a figure standing in the darkness, staring back at me with eyes that seemed to glow. I froze, unsure of what to do. I tried to radio for some backup, to which I received no response. I tried to back away slowly, but my feet would not move. This figure began to approach me, its footsteps echoing through the mostly empty factory. As it drew closer, I could make out something that wasn't human. Whatever it was, it was tall and thin, with limbs that seemed to bend in unnatural ways. Its skin was a sickly gray color, and its eyes reflected an eerie green. I suddenly found the strength to run, but the figure pursued me relentlessly. As I ran through the factory, I realized it wasn't just the two of us. I could hear the sound of multiple other footsteps behind me, closing in quickly. I ran as fast as I could, but I could feel their hot breath on the back of my neck. I could hear whispers, which seemed to be spoken in a different language, which I didn't understand. It was a guttural, animalistic language, filled with growls and hisses. Finally, I burst through the door and into the parking lot, gasping for breath. I turned around to see that the figures had stopped pursuing me now, but they still stared at me with those strange eyes. I could hear them whispering to each other, and I just knew they couldn't be human. I didn't know what to do then. I was supposed to stay on the factory grounds until my shift was over, but I couldn't bring myself to go back in there, where those things were waiting for me, watching me. I decided to call my supervisor and tell him what had happened. He didn't believe me at first, but when I insisted that I'd seen something weird, he agreed to send someone in to check on me. While I waited for my coworker to arrive, I sat in my car with the doors locked and the windows rolled up. I could still feel those glowing eyes on me, even from outside the car. When my coworker finally arrived, he searched the factory with a flashlight, but he didn't find anything. He thought I was crazy, and I really can't blame him. But I knew what I saw. After that night, things only got worse. Every time I worked the night shift, I could feel the presence of those inhuman figures lurking in the shadows. Here and there I heard their whispers. I thought about quitting the job, but I needed the money too badly. I couldn't afford to be unemployed. So I kept working, powering through it, even though every night was basically a living nightmare. On another night, as I was making more rounds, I heard another noise coming from the same wing of that factory where I had seen the figures before. I knew I should have ignored it, just continue on my rounds, but I couldn't help but investigate. I made my way over to the door, my heart pounding in my chest. I hesitated for a moment, then pushed the door open with my flashlight. Inside, I saw something that I would never forget. The figures were there. They were gathered around some kind of strange object. It looked like a small black box with glowing symbols etched into the sides. I didn't know what it was, but I could feel something awful radiating from it. As soon as the figures saw me, they turned to face me. They didn't whisper this time, but I could feel anger and hostility they began to crawl towards me, their footsteps echoing through the empty factory. I knew that I had to get out of there. I turned and ran as fast as I could, but I could hear them chasing me, their inhuman voices echoing through the factory, now calling out to me in that bizarre language. I could feel them getting closer. I pushed myself to the limit, running faster, but I couldn't be sure that I was outrunning them. Finally, I burst through the door and into the parking lot. I didn't stop running until I was several blocks away from the factory. I then collapsed, exhausted on the sidewalk, gasping for breath and shaking with fear. 
I knew that I couldn't keep working at the factory. I had to leave that place, no matter what it took. I contacted my supervisor and told him I was quitting, that I could not work there any longer. He tried to convince me to stay, but I was adamant on my decision. I left the factory that night, and I never looked back. I know the figures are still there, somewhere. Even though I'm miles away from that place, I can almost feel their eyes on me still. For months afterward, I had nightmares about the figures. I could hear their whispers in my dreams. I could feel their cold, inhuman touch. It was a horror I couldn't escape. Even now, years later, I still have nightmares. I have no idea what they were, or what they wanted, but I know they weren't human. That's about it. They were something else. Something malevolent. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>